Good evening, everybody. And it's great to see you all. And we have a great turnout. So this is the 19th use meeting of the UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by a couple guests I'm going to introduce in a minute, followed by Jeff D'Ambrosia from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, who's going to talk about how they are beginning to use more and more cloud computing services. Um, this meeting actually has a special focus. Mark Fisher, our Vice Chancellor for Administration, wrote an email earlier this month and talked about uh, the fact that we're celebrating disability awareness in October every year. Um, but this year, uh, it's especially meaningful because it's the 30th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They actually have a website for that, which I will put in the chat right here. Uh, and uh, the uh, actually, and he went on to say, and, and some of us know this, the Berkeley campus is the home of the disability rights and independent living movement. So um, to me, it seemed fitting that we should use this occasion to depart a little bit from our usual format and host a conversation between two very strong advocates for disability rights, who also happen to be very accomplished in helping those who need accommodations to use technology and to help those designing services um, so that those people can make those services accessible to people with disabilities. So I, on a personal note, I met Lucy Greco more than 10 years ago and from the very beginning was impressed with her dedication, drive and relentless insistence that we uh, people that work at Berkeley can do more to make this a better institution, to make Berkeley more inclusive to those people with disabilities. And her message has been one that brings people together and one of the things is that at some point, almost all of us will have a disability. So promoting accessibility helps all of us and it helps everybody. Uh, Lucy's work on the web access team has also driven home the fact that there are positive effects when making technology accessible, especially for the web. One of them is that the user experience gets improved for everybody. So anyway, Lucy's on my speed dial when I'm looking at new technologies or bringing people together to examine new services, because like security, accessibility needs to be baked in up front. Uh, tonight, Lucy is joined by Hadi Rangan, uh, who I've just met during some of the planning for the meetup, and he's great. He plays a similar role at the University of Washington's Accessible Technology Services Group, ATS, which includes the Accessibility Technology Center and Do IT. So I will turn it over to you both and we will be, we are ready for you. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I really appreciate that, that wonderful introduction. Um, as Bill said, I've been on campus for many years and really we've moved towards a, a more accessible campus in baby steps, but we keep moving forward. And it's really nice to know that I can now speak at things like this cloud meetup and have an audience that's, that's empathetic and sympathetic. So for those of you who are not aware of what we're actually talking about when we talk about accessibility, I wanna give a very brief introduction and then give a brief demo. And then I'm going to uh, hand it off to Hadi. So accessibility in this particular case refers to the ability to access information no matter what your ability or inability skill level is. So specifically we talk about persons with disabilities, but it can talk about people who don't necessarily identify as people with disabilities. Maybe it's somebody who's getting close to retirement and is maybe starting to have to squint a little bit as they uh, get a little older or somebody who is starting to lose their hearing and might have a little bit of difficulty in a loud crowded room. But in the extreme cases, this refers to people who are maybe totally blind, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, or people who may have the inability to access the computer in a normal way, be it with a computer keyboard or with a mouse, they maybe can't get to that normal interface and need alternative means to access. So everything from being able to control their computer by eye gaze or control their computer through something called a sip and puff switch this is accessibility at the extreme. 
But the small things you can do towards accessibility actually help even these extreme cases immensely. So I'm going to do a very quick demonstration of what an accessible website looks like. Uh, Bill, do I have permission to share my screen? I am working on the OK button. Nope. So I don't have permission to share my screen. We're, we're too super secure. OK, now you do. So share screen. Meeting control, home web access. So oh. this is our web access site, which is a site I'm really proud of here at Berkeley. And I'm going to let you all listen to it for a couple of seconds so you can hear what it sound, what a website that is coded well for accessibility sounds like to a person with a disability. And then I'm going to explain a little bit, and then it's time for Hadi to take over. Links. So here we go. We're starting at the top of the page. Just take a listen. Link skip to main content. Banner landmark link UC Berkeley link IST architecture, platforms, and integration. Heading level one web access. Site navigation, navigation landmark, site wide search, search landmark, clickable search terms. Edit has auto complete search the site button, submit search. List with six items link current page home. Collapse sub menu link web accessibility at UC. Collapse sub menu link evaluating your site. Collapse sub menu link resources. Collapse sub menu link about. Link FAQ out of list. List with one items link web platform services out of list. Main landmark link heading level two accessibility is usability. Image credit, Keegan Hauser. Heading level two, what does web accessibility mean for you? The University of California. So very quickly, you heard a bunch of stuff there. And I'm going to explain to you what some of those things you heard were. You heard the announcement of headings on the page. Skip links, navigate, banner, landmark, web access, heading level one. Which is the page title. It's a heading level one. Main landmark accessibility is usability. Heading level two link. And then there's a heading level two. Blind people can access the internet much quicker. From Bill Allison to everyone. Note Lucy took pity on us and played the audio at a slower speed we mortals can comprehend alert you forgot not to chat bill <laughs> sorry about that um so as you as you can hear the um you can move heading by heading and this is the way a blind person gets the outline of a web page the other thing that html5 offers us is the ability to navigate the page by different sections of the page so on this particular page, we have skip links, navigation, landmark link, skip to main content. We have a skip link at the very top of the page. And then as we move through the page, I can move landmark by landmark, or in this case, they're HTML5 regions. So I just hit a keystroke to move. Banner landmark, you see Berkeley link. The banner. Site navigation, navigation, landmark, site wide search, search landmark, clickable search terms. And then there is the, the site wide navigation and the very first section in that is search. So I move to the navigation, the search is the first part of that. It's its own separate little region. Main landmark accessibility is usability. And then we have the Heading main- Heading level two link. Then we have the main content. And if I was using another screen reader, I actually could have jumped to that main content with a single keystroke but I prefer using this screen reader, which doesn't give me that keystroke. Um, the links all have good labels and I wanna show you something that we've done on web access that I'm particularly proud of. Banner list with six items FAQ link. Evaluating your site collapse sub menu link. So you'll see that there's a menu on this site or as we call it a mega menu. And this mega menu is a bunch of items that it tells me that it's collapsible and expandable. So listen again. Resources collapse sub menu link. So it tells me it's resources, it's a menu and it's collapsed. So I can click on that to open it. Expanded. And the screen reader will tell me that it's open. I can move into it and read the contents now. List with one items graphics Sathergate. And it's got the nice little image of Sathergate. 
but this is the thing that I really like that we've done. Resources. Exp I decided I don't want to be in resources. I'm going to go back and see if one of these other menus is correct. Evaluating your site collapsed sub menu link. Resources closed. And that resources menu closed behind me because we don't want it covering up the content underneath it visually. And it told me as a screen reader user that it did close that menu behind me. So I'm not looking for that content again. This is a very quick, quick demo. Um, this is all I'm going to demonstrate today. Any of you, if you want to know more, should visit this site and explore. And please reach out and I can talk to you more about it. But now I'm going to hand it over to Hadi. So I'm going to uh, go back to the meeting here meeting, me and stop sharing my screen so it's not distracting. Zoom meeting. Speech mode off. Hadi, your turn. Good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this round table. This is Hadi Rangin, a member of IT accessibility team at University of Washington. My, com my background is in computer science and I have been in this area for over uh, you know, 25, you know, if I consider my, my background in Germany, it will be almost 30 years. Uh, I have I'm, I'm, for your information, I'm blind uh, and uh, I use screen readers like uh, Lucidas, very similar combination of tools uh, and uh, assistive technology. So I experienced the accessibility as, as, a, as a student, as a faculty, as a, you know, as a researcher, now uh, as an IT accessibility specialist for uh, with, with, with multiple hats. Prior to University of Washington, uh, I worked for 10 years for University of Illinois. So with this uh, long introduction, I mean, we, uh, what, what you have seen about accessibility is really a very small fraction of accessibility. Don't, don't be surprised if you were lost. So it, accessibility is quite abstract. And it takes some time, you know, to uh, understand and digest the information. So if you have any question, as Lucy mentioned, reach out to her and she will be more than happy to answer uh, all your questions and meet with you and then, uh, you know, go to, uh, and, uh, you know, bring you on board with accessibility. So how we handle accessibility at, at a higher education, you know, we, we go 15, 20 years back, uh, it was extremely difficult. You know, the software company, they didn't have a really good understanding about accessibility. Accessibility was required, but not many people were, uh, were aware of it, uh, of it or didn't know how to really ask for accessibility and at the same time you know those vendors they were not uh, they didn't know how to deliver their products in accessible way so landscape has changed and companies have much more understanding about accessibility in selected uh, higher education system accessibility is taught um, more designer and developers are aware of and then more <clears throat> uh, purchaser, those people who really make these decisions to bring this IT solution to our uh, uh, you know, entities, uh, they are more aware of, aware of that and then they ask our accessibility questions. And most importantly, there are more accessibility uh, you know, people, knowledgeable people, um, you know, like Lucy and, and maybe me also uh, <laughs> in this field that they can, who can help. Um, the problem when we're purchasing a product is not that we can go, you know, like Amazon, you go you purchase an eye look in item, you have, you know, uh, 28 items that you, they might be relevant, and then you look into the feature list and then say that, hey, I like this, this product. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury to shop for accessible products. Some of the accessible, some of the products that we use, like you know, human resource application or this application that we are using, like Zoom, it is a kind of a decision that is taken at the higher uh, level, and then we, regardless they are accessible or not, we know that the campus needs them. So what we do that is uh, we. Uh, work with those people who are purchasing these products. 
in our campus, like very similarly, I think in your campus, when our IT department or campus decides to purchase a product, so they engage us in the RFP process. So we have, for example, six bidders, and then they give, we ask some basic accessibility question, and we ask about, is the term, it's called VPAT, V-P-A-T-S, Tom, stands for Volunteer Product Accessibility Template. So it is kind of self-disclosed information about the accessibility of the products. So some companies in the past, especially, they outsourced these statements and then to explain you know, a lot about the accessibility of the products. And then uh, those purchasers who wanted to purchase, uh, they looked into that and said that oh, they saw the terms and ter or the, the sentences or the phrases that they wanted to see that. For example, we are VCAG, blah, blah, uh, what were version number of 508 compliant. So the mission accomplished. So they saw that. And then they purchased that. And then later they realized, after they deployed that, is they realized that it is, oh, they are receiving a lot of complaint. And indeed, it is not even keyboard accessible or screen reader accessible, or you cannot magnify it. And that has tons of other accessibility, usability problems. But the vendors, you know, they received their money and they were no, no longer inter interested in, in working with you so, uh, to, to resolve the issues. And then if yes, then they really didn't understand accessibility. So what we have, uh, have been doing for, for in, the, in, the, in the past 15 or plus years is that we get involved in the RFP process, we identify the accessibility issues with those products, and we tell the vendors, hey, we really highly respect your VPAT, your, you know, your statement about accessibility, but we would love to, independently verify those issues. And then uh, I, I can tell you VPAT, it's quite entertaining the statement. Uh, sometimes, you know, they, they really explain things that are not technically possible, but, you know, how should, how, depending on the purchaser, how, access, how knowledgeable the person is, uh, then it, it can be quite confusing and misleading. So, once we identify, when once we test and evaluate the products before signing the contract, again, it is important that you do all this stuff before signing the contract. So you ask as a part of the negotiation for a sandbox, a sandbox with some real data in it. And then we, uh, you perform the test, you work with those potential service owner and managers who will be servicing the university or your uh, entity for that. And then you learn from them what the functional tasks or common use cases will be. And then you perform the test with them. Again, it is important with those people who are managing the software. Remember, at the end of the road, those people who bring the products to the campus, they are accountable and responsible for, access, for uh, uh, privacy, security, and, you know, integration, and all those aspects of you know, purchasing or bringing a new product, including accessibility. So we are, as an accessibility expert, you know, uh, uh, your eyes and arms and somehow knowledge, and then uh, we can help you to identify these issues. So back to what I was saying that, you know, we work with the service owner, service manager of that product, and then we perform the task based on the functional tasks that they identify. We compile the report and we share it with the people who are in the RFP uh, search team. And then uh, we, once we have it, then when we know that, the, for example, the bidder one is the, the, the final uh, the finalist, you know, we sit down with them and tell, we tell them, hey, these are the issues that we have. We prioritize the issue, prior, priority one, priority two, priority three. And then those priority issue one issues that have high impact. It means that most uh, users have to go through it, have to deal with it. So we call them, we label them as a deployment blocker. And I tell you, software, the, the uh, software company, they hate that term. So it is a very strong term. Deployment blocker. 
So once we do it, uh, uh, then then we uh, we nego negotiate on some timeline. So and that those timeline goes in the contract. So we, we have really quite interesting contracts with some of the vendors. In, in one of the real cases, we even agreed that we, we withhold some payments until they, uh, they, 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 they deliver what they have uh, promised. So, and then the, we remain engaged with them, we collaborate with them, and we help them to uh, really achieve the, the, the accessibility level that we agreed in the contract. So, I, 526. So, tell me, uh, I, I mean, I can tell you uh, really for hours about the various uh, collaboration that we have. Uh, sometimes, you know, some products are smaller, the smaller companies are sometimes easier. Um, uh, you might, for example, want to know that, you know, we had collaboration with uh, big companies sometimes, Workday, you know, we, we had, uh, co co you know, worked with uh, uh, another, I think, big project, uh, Google Cloud platform team. They were really good player and then they, they, they wanted to get to the Internet 2 market. And that was, I think, another um, encouraging factor for, for to reach some certain level of accessibility. We worked with companies like Zoom, and Microsoft. I think you, everybody knows that we worked with Microsoft uh, on various uh, products, uh, various with various things from Microsoft Office up to you know Windows team and Mac Outlook team. And many, many really products. I don't want to list that, but uh, if you are interested, please contact me or just search for, for my uh, profile. You will see the projects that we are working on. So with, with this stuff, I just wanted to mention, emphasize that accessibility is the responsibility of, of the, those people who bring those products to the campus and then don't think it is too abstract. Do you have a lot of resources that they can help you? Uh, and the campus and the company to gain the knowledge. So we, for example, we meet with many of these uh, companies on a regular basis, sometime, you know, on a weekly basis, bi-weekly or, or, or monthly, and then help them with the various issues that we find. And, uh, and then over time, we have become the design partner with many of them. So back to you, Lucy. And, and I want to point out what the very last thing that Hadi said there is he becomes the design partner for these various agencies. And within the past year and a half, we've started taking up this model at Berkeley as well. Um, you know, any of the vendors that I have addressed the products and looked at the products and found issues, I'm available to those vendors as well as a resource, just like Hadi's team, to sit down and work with them through the issues and help them come up with the design and the fixes to the accessibility barriers. Um, anyone dealing with myself or Hottie in the uh, mainstream marketplace has an amazing asset. It's an asset that's free and available to them because we at Berkeley and we at Washington need these products. And so we're gonna make sure that they work for us but now these companies get our service for free. If they didn't have access to me and Hadi, they would be paying hundreds and thousands of dollars for that work to be done by some of these other people out there contracting in the mainstream. So we're adding value to products, not only for Berkeley and Washington, but for other universities and other companies around the world. And I would say that this is also a win-win situation. Yes, they are using us as a free resources, but at the same time, we enable those people who need these products to be accessible. Uh, and then, you know, we, we help them to become proactive in their education or in their work, instead of, you know, accommodating them, which is usually time consuming, which is not real time or, or sometimes wishy-washy, but for example, like this, this product, Zoom, at the time it has been introduced to us many years ago, it, I can tell you, it was almost 0% accessible. And then, but it was, we were in a pilot project and then uh, 
the, the com company showed really strong interest in, in making the product accessible. They worked with us. They, we traveled they forward many, many times to Seattle. We went to, the, to, to them and then talked with their uh, the, you know, designer developers and discussed a lot of issues, met hundreds of hours. And then until we were able to fix the, some of the issues and then slowly you know, move uh, the, the, the enhancement of accessibility into new design. Many things that we have now, uh, they are really new, they, they have, 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 have been redesigned. The same thing with, with, the, with Google Cloud. Google Cloud at the time that we had, we had access to, it was poorly up to not accessible, but we worked with the Google team many times. They came to Seattle again for many times. To, we met with them and then discussed the issues and showed them issues and sometimes even delivered the sample code or sample interaction model. And then uh, over time, it has become accessible. I'm not saying I'm not endorsing this program, program that uh, application are 100% accessible, but uh, it is uh, really an ongoing effort. And then, uh, but they have some uh, certain, I would say, reasonable access of uh, level of accessibility. Well, and we form partnerships really, Hadi. I mean, we get the product we need by the work we're doing. You and I influence the products to move in the direction that our universities and and well, let's be let's be perfectly frank. If you can't use the product you're testing, Hadi Ranjan can't use it. Your students and nobody else can. So we're making these products better by working with these companies and making them so that you and I can use them to do our jobs. Just because our job happens to be working with these companies to fix them, doesn't mean we still don't need to use them on a daily basis. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, again, as I said, we have, uh, we can talk a lot about accessibility, uh, but uh, we have been told that uh, you uh, might have uh, many questions uh, and then the, for the remaining of time, uh, Bill, if you think it is uh, the time, you know, we open the floor for questions. Great, so uh, why don't we open the floor for questions and then um, we will take it from there. Thank you so much, Hadi and Lucy. Pleasure. You're welcome. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just sitting here thinking that, you know, here's a room full of um, IT professionals and students and all kinds of different folks. And I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, what, what can we do about accessibility? Um, how can we make a change in this area through our work? It's so I'll take that first, Hadi, and then I'll okay. add it off to you. Okay. The number one thing you can do is reach out and learn. Understand what it means to be accessible. The only way you can do that is by looking around, trying to understand, find a person with a disability, talk to them about what their needs are, ask them how to fix things, ask them what their big barriers and burdens are. Um, my big theme on all the talks I give this year is hire a person with a disability. If you have a team where you're about to, you know, start hiring engineers, actively look for an engineer who might have a disability. That's going to help you understand people with disabilities needs. Not every person with disabilities needs. It's just going to help you understand what that particular person needs, but that's moving one step closer to all people with disabilities. Your turn, Patty. Okay, thank you. I would say that I mean, it depends what you can do. It is It depends on your role. If you are administrator, IT professionals, a decision maker, then you are in trouble. Then you are responsible. Believe me, if somebody comes and complains and you have to answer that, you are the, will be the first person to have to answer why you brought an, an, an inaccessible product to campus. Okay? And then what was your uh, you know, uh, process to ensure the product was accessible? So if you, again, if you are that, that group, Good luck. You you don't have very much choice, and you need to work with the, or develop the accessibility knowledge within your team, 
So you can independently verify the, this accessibility claim by vendor, various vendors, and then you know uh, identify the issues, work with them, and then uh, help them to resolve. So this is, this is a different thing that I told you uh, earlier. We usually work, I usually, my main focus is on that area. If you are a faculty, if you are a staff and then you're using, you know, your faculty is saying, hey, I think I want to bring, uh, use a specific tool, just just an example. I mean, we got, I got involved recently in a product, accessibility of a product, it's called Muro. I, I, I can't even pronounce it, Muro, M-U-R-A-L. It is highly, it is very sophisticated application um, for the collaboration meeting. And then I, as a, as a programmer, as a, as a software engineer, I highly uh, the, respect the, the, the power or brain power has gone into that development, but naturally is very inaccessible. There's, we, but once it was brought to us and we contacted, or that person contacted the company and the entire or big team of Miro, you know, they showed up and they wanted to learn about accessibility because they know that it is matter. And then they know that they cannot sell it to at least higher education without being accessible. So they are eager for that. So even you think you, your product is a small and then you might not be impacted, you know, not that many people might be using that. Uh, it is possible, you know, that the company uh, has never heard about it or they are ready to uh, work with you and then make the product accessible. But please, you know, in either case, as Lucy mentioned that you need to, if you are not, we are not expecting that you all ac become accessibility expert, but every campus you has usually as accessibility resources, contact them and get some help. And if you are, uh, not involved, you're not faculty, staff, or, 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 or decision maker, and but you are involved in using some product. If you see that your company, your department is introducing a product, you can simply ask basic questions. Is it accessible? I mean, has anyone tested it for accessibility? Have there, has there been any VPAD that, you know, that they claim how accessibility is? Or uh, has any professional has looked into that and checked that? Or do you have any user with disability in, in that immediate uh, neighborhood that you can check for accessibility? It starts with usually asking questions. And then, uh, uh, and then I, I, I tell you, I, in my life, I maybe met thousand, if not more, designer and developer during, during my career. Many develop, designer, or, or I would say that I have seen very, very few designers developer who wouldn't care for accessibility. Once they learn about it, they would love to learn it. They would, they would love to make it accessible. So if maybe the designer or the company is not aware or are not aware of what the problem, but you know, just by asking and then engaging them in the accessibility conversation, you probably will see that a lot of interest and probably they go on their own and then to hire a consulting company to become accessible. So a, a long answer to a short question. So. Thank you, Hadi. We have a few more minutes if there are any other questions. So while we're waiting for another question to come in at Berkeley, we have a checklist that can be that should be included in every purchase we make. And that question asks some basic question. The questionnaire asks, asks some basic. Bleh, let me try that again. Some basic questions about what the company's commitment to accessibility is and how they guarantee accessibility. And then it goes through the W3C checklist in an easy to understand English form. And that that checklist is at UCOP available, free and publicly available for everyone to see. So this is Alice and Henry. Uh, I wondered if you could touch on how this all relates to the Americans with Disabilities Act and if we are you know, potentially subject to sanctions or penalties if we procure technology that um, doesn't allow everyone to participate, especially students. 
100% it does because as a public university, we are subject to uh, chapter two of the ADA uh, because we are a public entity and our programs and resources must be available to all members of the public. Uh, but we are also subject to something called Section 504 and 508, which is older than the ADA. And these are Rehabilitation Act 508 and, or 504 and 508. And these things say that what we purchase, what we use, what we engage with must be accessible to all members of our community. Uh, as for sanctions, we are liable in every regard, if somebody who act, tries to access one of our programs or services cannot use that service or program, they are, you know, they're in their right to sue us. And the end results of us being sued can, you know, not only be monetary sanction, but, and we've seen this many times before, when we lose these cases, and we inevitably do a lot of the time, the regulations put upon us are much stricter and harder to follow than if we had just done it right to begin with. And then we have to do a bunch of reporting and a bunch of energy, you know, a lot of energy goes into complying with a settlement that could have better been used to actually provide the service in an accessible way to begin with. Does that answer your question, Allison? Yes, thank you. And I know there have been cases of this at Berkeley and I'm sure at many other institutions as well. So. There isn't a university across this nation that hasn't been hit. Thank you both very much. Um, we will move on now to um, some announcements. All right, thank I you, will... Bill. Thank you. I'm going to be signing off now. All right, thank you. Thank you, All right, thank you very thank much you. for inviting us. I appreciate that. Thank you.